Guys, alarm bells should be going off right now. We are now at the very last chance to qualify for the Olympic Games, and Mejdi Shalk, the tip of the spear of men's bouldering, is at the moment not going to qualify. He still has one last chance to overcome a bunch of hurdles, but the gist of this is he was the best male boulderer in 2023. If he had competed at all the comps this year, that year, or even just like most of them, I think he would have made history for the most incredible male bouldering season that we've ever seen. When I say he's the tip of the spear of male bouldering, I mean the same way we thought of Tomoe Narasaki a few years ago as being the guy leading the charge into imaginative and daring movement. Mejdi is that kid. Right now, he didn't manage to qualify for the Olympics at the Bern World Championship, nor did he make it through the European qualifier in Laval. And so now it's just down to these OQS events, Shanghai and in a couple weeks, Budapest. And he's got to make enough points between those two events to be in the top two French competitors. At the moment, he is not. He didn't make finals in Shanghai. And so right now it would be Sam Avazou and Paul Genft taking those French spots at Paris 2024. Bouldering and lead is not a discipline. This, this discipline, this exercise in combined climbing isn't going to exist the second that the Olympics give us another medal and we can finally break all of the disciplines apart. So the only purpose of boulder and lead being in the Olympics is to showcase the good in our sport, whether that's just the fun of watching it or the incredible athletes who deserve some kind of platform, even if it makes no difference in the history of climbing, honestly. If it's meant to be a showcase, someone like Mejdi has to be there, not just because he's French, but because he is the very best that we have to offer today. And it would be a huge disappointment if he gave up what could have been a groundbreaking 2023 bouldering season to try and qualify for this Olympic Games and then didn't make it happen. So in Budapest, he has to do really well. He has to overcome at least one of his two teammates. He's playing from behind the eight ball. He's got to come up from below these other competitors and he's got to make it happen. My nerves are is that he's not necessarily a big game player. I'm worried that he doesn't have the headspace to handle that kind of stress when it matters. So my fingers are crossed. Now things were close in Shanghai. It's not like everybody was super far apart, but that's the nature of the sport. You've got to make sure the margins are on your side. And part of that was due to maybe kind of weird route setting and unusual travel and the weather as well. And speaking of the weather, I wanted to just bring up one little tidbit. It was hot in China and it's going to be hot in Paris. And it was, holy crap, it was hot in Tokyo 2021. That's the nature of being part of the summer games. But if you look a little bit back at the history of competitive climbing and our pursuit of the Olympic Games, we were actually almost on track to maybe be a better candidate for the Winter Games. The 1992 Winter Games in Albertville, France, featured a like pre-Olympic showcase of competitive climbing in Chambéry, I think. And in 2006, in Turin, the Winter Games there in Italy, uh, Turin also happens to be the, the home base for the IFSC, there was also a demonstration of sport climbing featuring a bunch of the big stars of that day. Maybe I'll throw some images up. And if you think about the history of competitive climbing, where were most of our comps held at? It was mostly held in mountain towns, often towns that had like a, a skiing connection. If you look back to like the Top Rock Challenge, the precursor to bouldering World Cups, every single stop was held in effectively like a ski town. We have this connection to winter sports and skiing and snowboarding because we live in the mountains like those other sports. And as we've kind of started to see our weather can be, or pardon me, our sport can be a little bit weather dependent, and it almost doesn't matter whether our comps happen in the summer or winter. So if a lot of these winter Olympics happen in mountain towns, maybe it would make more sense for us in the long run to compete in those games where we can be indoors and we can acknowledge our mountain history and not worry so much about climbing at qualifying events that are in these sweaty, sweaty locales at sweaty, sweaty times. I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts? Anybody else have? Oh, is that Ginny? Ginny, do you have thoughts? What did you think about this comp? Hey, Tyler. I love seeing big players 
peek at these Olympic qualifying comps where it matters. Um, for example, Adam and Alberto and kind of Jakob and Bern as well. They aren't typically people who are super consistent at the World Cups right now. And so you kind of sit there and wonder if they've lost their spark. But then they come back and they remind you that they were just taking it easy before or they were training through those previous comps. So I always think that's interesting to see. And finally, it was really great to see Do Young come out on top in the end because I felt like during the boulder round, he was doing pretty well on the boulders, but he kept dropping just the top. And so that's always a heartbreaker. It really hurt his boulder score because he had zero tops, I believe. So I'm glad he was able to come back and make it up fully in lead and take the top spot. Very cool. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, it, I mean, my personal heartthrob, Alberto Hines Lopez, what an incredible weekend to watch him climb. And I was a fan of him before he won the Olympics. I liked him back in 2019, so everybody back up. But yeah, seeing these guys perform big was awesome. And it's actually a really cool uh, uh, demonstration of the difference between men's and women's climbing. On the women's side, we see so much consistency. But on the men's, you're right. If we miss some of the boys from some comps for just a couple of weeks or months or maybe a season, it's so hard to tell where they're going to come back to in terms of level. Whereas on the women's side, it's actually fairly easy to predict and say, yeah, yanni has got a broken toe, but she's going to come back and be in first place whenever she returns, right? Yeah, very cool. Um, let's move on. We're going to wrap this up and make it super tight. Let's take a look at what the standings were in the top 20 for the OQS. And we're just going to highlight who would make it through to the Olympics if the decisions were made today. And they're not. So this is totally preemptive, but we're just going to look at it for the fun of it. Of course, there's one more event for them to earn points. Let's see what we got. If it all ended today, Doyen Lee, Alberto Hines Lopez, Adam Wandra, these are awesome names to make it through to the Olympics. And of course, like we talked about earlier, Paul Jenft and, uh, and lower down Sam Avazu also getting through. Hannes van Doysen, Sasha Lehman. Now we're talking. These are the guys I want to see in this competition. Yannick Flohe making the cut and there in the red in 10th place, Mejdi Schalk not being in the top two French athletes. Nicholas Cullen, Alex Magos is going through again to his second Olympics, and Yufei Pan would also hypothetically make his second Olympics if things stood where they are. I think this makes a lot of sense. It's sad that we wouldn't see a Slovenian athlete going through, at least on the men's side, but, you know, that's, uh, that's the way the cookie crumbles. In women's bouldering, Brooke Rabatou, of course. Cheyenne So is going in, in this case, to her second Olympic Games. And Erin McNeese, this incredible resurgence, kind of a new lease on her climbing life after a few years away, looking incredible and getting all of these like top five finishes so far this season. And on the women's side, that probably most tightly watched competition, it was between Miho and Futaba for who is going to be the second Japanese female climber in Boulder and lead. Aimori already has her spot locked, but it's between Miho and Futaba for the second spot. And honestly, I'm okay if Miho takes it. I think she's got better credentials. She's got a more interesting history. And I think she has not just a higher ceiling, but a way higher floor than Futaba has in competitions lately. Evgenia Kazbakova makes a comeback that we haven't seen from her since like 2019 again. Gilu Lo, Zilia Avazu, Camilla Maroney, Lucia Dorfel, Jane Kim squeaking through in this case. Mia Krampel taking that second Slovenian slot uh, alongside Yanya. And of course, Molly Thompson-Smith in this hypothetical would round out the American team of two along with Aaron McNeese. In men's speed, Indonesia, China, the USA, they've already got one spot locked, and so a ton of this top 10 is already spoken for. But in this world, Vedric Leonardo takes that second spot and blocks Kira Malkatabin from competing at these upcoming Olympic Games. Peng Wu takes the second Chinese spot. Yaroslav Kach, we're going to have some Ukrainian representation in this world. Reza Ali Porshena Zandafar gets to go to the Olympics, somebody that dominated the speed record for so long, kind of in that 2017-18-19 era. World champion, he's going to the Olympics. Zach Hammer takes the second U.S. spot. Amir Maimuratov is going to take the Kazakhstani spot. And Unshul Shin, representing Korea, would be that final place in the men's speed. And in women's speed, much of the same story. China, Indonesia, and Poland all have a spot already spoken for. And so it is down for a final place 
in the current situation, it would be Yafe Joe from China, Rajia Salsabila, and Natalia Kaluchka taking those final spots. Jimin Jong and Capuchin Viglioni would, uh, would follow up in fourth and fifth, and then going all the way down to Beatrice Colli and Leslie Romero Perez from Spain would take the remaining spots in women's speed. And that's all I got for this week. Some excitement for the athletes who are doing well and some some nerves around athletes like Mejdi Schalk. And I didn't even mention Stasha Gay or Fanny Gibert. And back in 2019, we probably would have talked about them as being like Olympic favorites, not just at the time, but in any future games, it didn't include speed. But I guess the world is just passing them by. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Join the Plastic Weekly Discord if you made it all the way to the end of the video. And if you want to support content like this, check out our Patreon or leave a super thanks below otherwise thanks for watching see you guys in the next one